Uh, my name is Adam, and I'm a millennial. Uh, it's fascinating because as soon as I say that, there's all sorts of assumptions, ideas, and understandings just off that one word. You see, we all come from different generations. And what's fascinating, whether you're a baby boomer, a Gen Xer, a millennial, a Gen Zer, wherever you may find yourself in the generation spectrum, we can acknowledge that different generations provide different insights into what that specific generation was all about, what it went through, and some of those things. And one of my favorite things is a game that I've seen before on Jimmy Kimmel Live called Generation Gap. Maybe you've seen it before, maybe you haven't. But the cool aspect behind this game is that they take someone from a younger generation and they also bring someone in from an older generation and they ask respective questions about each other's generation. So for instance, they may ask the younger boy, uh, who is the Wright brothers? And you would know that they you know, helped kind of fly the planes and did different things like that. And, uh, but sometimes the younger guy would be like, I have no idea who the Wright brothers are. Then they would turn to the older person and they would say maybe to the older person, do you know who the D'Amelio twins are? And they'd be like, I have no idea. And meanwhile, if you are from that generation, you're kind of eaten up a little bit inside because you're like, I know this answer. I can't believe they don't. This generation gap, one of the interesting things about this game is that it shows the different aspects of each generation, the things that they've gone through, they're good and they're not so good. And you see, the Bible is absolutely no different. You see, as we arrive to the book of Joshua, we'll have seen up to this point at least three immediate generations. The first generation that you will see is the Egypt generation. The second one is known as the, uh, what I would call the wandering or the wilderness generation. And then the third one will be the promised land generation. Just a quick word on each. First is the Egypt generation. Uh, what you may know is that there was a group of Israelites who were enslaved in Egypt. What's fascinating is that they weren't supposed to be enslaved in Egypt. Uh, if you go back and read in Genesis, uh, the book of Genesis, I think it's around chapter 50 or so, um, what happens is there's a famine in the land of the Canaanites where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's family uh, lives. But this guy named Joseph is down in Egypt. And so what his family decides to do is they decide to go down to Egypt to escape the famine. Now, they escape the famine and they land in Egypt, but then they just start to settle there. They're in Egypt, and before you know it, many decades, many centuries have passed, and they are still enslaved in Egypt. And I think that's a harrowing lesson for each and every one of us. It's a lesson because the thing that you escape to can end up becoming the thing that enslaves you. You see, each and every one of us, we all like to sometimes escape or to go to dirt certain things. Uh, for some people, it may be food. Others, it may be pornography. Others, it may be drugs and alcohol. Uh, some of us, we may just love to escape to God. But be careful because the thing that you escape to becomes sometimes the thing that you are enslaved by. And you'll wake up and it'll be many years later and you're like, how in the world am I still trapped in this scenario. And that was the story of the Israelites up to that point. They escaped to Egypt for a famine, became complacent, and then that became the thing that enslaved them. So then we fast forward to the next generation and we get to the wilderness generation. The ironic thing about the uh, wilderness generation is that captivity, physical captivity, wasn't the thing that marked them, but the captivity comparison. Uh, specifically, comparison was the thing that trapped them. You see, they escape from Egypt, they go through the Exodus, and they're in this weird in-between. They're not quite where, like, where were they were before, where they were enslaved, but they're also not where they want to be, the promised land, the freedom. And what you see is this constant back and forth, this comparison game, um, going back and forth where they're not quite where they once were and they're not where they are wanting to go. We see this perfectly played out in Numbers chapter 13. 
In Numbers 13, starting in verse 33, uh, we'll have the text up on the screens. This is right after the spies uh, went into the promised land and came back and gave the report to uh, the people. In the report, they say, we saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the ne- that are come from the Nephilim. They say, we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. You see, they weren't in physical captivity, but they were almost in like a mental captivity. They still had some of their slavery in their minds. We looked like grasshoppers, and we looked the same to them. But if you continue on, it says that all night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or even in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. It's crazy to think that this wandering wilderness generation who's out of the slavery and captivity, the very thing they wanted deliverance from, but yet here they are desiring to go back to that. They don't want to inherit the inheritance, the promised land from God. And so what we'll see is that this wandering wilderness generation will wander for 40 years in the wilderness as the generation, that generation begins to die off and a new generation emerges, one that we are going to be well acquainted with over the next few weeks, and that is the promised land generation. You see, the Egypt generation struggled with captivity and the wilderness generation struggled with comparison. What we will find out is that this promised land generation will likely struggle with complacency. They've arrived. They're in the promised land and they have really just one important command. Tim touched on it last week. Be very strong and courageous, but very strong and courageous in what? In obeying all that the Lord has commanded. So the the haunting, harrowing question set before this generation is will they be faithful to obey everything that the Lord has commanded? Not to turn to the right or to left, but to be faithful and true to God and his word. Ironically for us, we know how the story kind of ends. Uh, So we know the struggles that they're about to face. But as the reader, that's the tension. Will this new generation finally rise up and be that generation to fully obey God's calling and command on their lives? Well, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter six because we're going to see how they start this mission. But as you're turning there, I would like to actually start with the previous chapter in chapter five. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. We'll have the text up on the screens. Joshua is the sixth book of the Old Testament. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Then you have Joshua. And we're gonna start in Joshua chapter five uh, first. The uh, lesson we're gonna be looking at is one that maybe you have read about or heard about if you grew up in church, maybe in Sunday school or VBS, and it's the, the walls of Jericho falling down. And it's one that when you remember it, You definitely like remember it. Maybe you saw it acted out or something like that. But then if you go back and read it, you're like, wait, I don't remember that being in the Bible. I almost titled this message, What They Don't Teach You in Sunday School. Uh, But I think the, uh, the fall of Jericho works just as well too. Um, But this is the first journey that they're about to enter into as God has commanded and commissioned them to do it. But before they enter Jericho, there is a really important encounter that Joshua has with this person. And it's at the very end of chapter five. It's important that we don't miss this because this this passage will unlock the rest of the book for us. Joshua, we read in chapter 5, verse 13, was near Jericho, about to go forward. But he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or are you for our enemies? Are you one of us or are you one of our enemies? 
But pay attention to what the angel of the Lord says. He says, neither. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. So Joshua realizes that he is face to face with this angelic godlike figure and he falls face down to the ground in reverence and said, what's, what's the message that the Lord has for me, the servant? And the commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Uh, if you've read any parts of the first five books, you may remember that. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. Of course, we know this to be an allusion to Exodus chapter three, verse five. When Moses is, uh, sees the, the burning bush and he goes towards it and God speaks out from that bush and says, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And here we see the same exact thing. Right before an incredible mission, God meets with his people and has a very important conversation. And the conversation, the, the gist of it is really important. Because again, we know that Joshua is a representation of Israel and he's about to go into the land of the Canaanites and he's going to demolish a lot of those cities so that they can kind of take it in. So Joshua asks a really important question. Angel of the Lord, God, whatever you want to call it, are you for us or are you for our enemies? And he says, neither. It's kind of fascinating, isn't it? It's important because here's the distinction that the angel of the Lord, the commander of the Lord's army is saying. Sometimes you and I can divide out good people versus bad people, right? The good guys versus the bad guys, and we want to ask God, God, are you for us or are you against us? Are you with the good guys or are you with the bad guys? But God says that's the wrong question to be asking. In fact, the better question to be asking is, are you on the Lord's side? Because the Lord's side is always the right side. Because you can be on God's side, but not be on God's side. You think you're carrying out God's mission, but you're way off track. And that's going to be the beautiful but yet haunting picture that we get in Joshua chapter 6 and 7 because it's a one-two punch. It's a compare and contrast. What we'll find out today is that they did really good in Jericho. They were faithful to obey God's promises and, and God's instructions. But next week, if you're happy enough to come back to church, Mike is going to talk about when things don't go so well, when they do deviate. You see, the question that God has in front of his people is, are you on my side? And that's the question that really I want to pose to you to consider this morning, is whose side are you on? Do you think you're on your side or are you actually on God's side? That is what the question is posed before Joshua and all of Israel. But alas, we go ahead and move forward to chapter six and we arrive to this famous story. In verse one, we read that the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites and no one went out and no one came in. This was a defense mechanism. Jericho wanted to make sure that they protected themselves from any attack. But this also isn't a defensive maneuver. It's also a mindset. You see, this is a representation of, yes, they are securing themselves from military invasion, but it's also a representation of they do not want to accept anything from God. They are set in their ways and they are ready to die on that hill, no pun intended. And so it's important to see that this is contrasted with someone of their own people, Rahab. If you go back to Joshua chapter two, in fact, I'll just turn there real briefly. We won't have it on the screen, but uh, Rahab is one of these Canaanites, but she herself is not defensive to God, but in fact, open. Listen to what she says in Joshua chapter two when she's speaking to some of the spies. She says, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We've heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings um, of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. 
for the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. You see, while the city may be defensive and on guard, Rahab is contrasted because she is open and willing to accept the Lord and in fact, the people. You see, the people of Jericho had two options. They could submit and they could give themselves wholly to the Israelites and effectively to the Lord, or they could stand their ground and try to beat the Lord and to beat the Israelites, even though they knew all the amazing things that God was doing. So this is the contrast that we see. As we continue on in the story in verse two, it says, then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men and do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city, not once, but seven times with the priests blowing their trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast of the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. Now you listen to any commentator, you could research this passage and I would say every commentator would tell you that this military strategy is terrible. I mean, think about it. Hey, let's go conquer this city. So what we're going to do is we're not going to bring our swords. We're not going to do much. We're just going to blow some trumpets and march around the city for a week. Yeah, that, that's a great military strategy. And honestly, like I asked myself, I'm like, man, God, like why? I mean, doesn't that sound kind of silly, right? Like just march around the city once a day for six days. And then on the seventh day, just march around it seven times and it's yours. It's like, okay, why? And I don't know exactly why, but my hunch is this. God wants to make it very clear that the victory that they already have is coming from God and not themselves. The battle belongs to the Lord. All they have to do is trust him and obey him. And that's sure enough going to be the case here. That if they trust and obey the Lord, he will be true in his promises. Because as the passage just said already at the very beginning, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. The battle is won, but you have to wait seven days to see the victory. And that's a hard lesson for some of us, right? We believe and trust in the promises of God, but yet it feels like we have to wait a while to see it come to fruition. But if we trust and if we obey, we will see the faithfulness of God and the promises of God prevail in our lives. As we continue on in the story in verse six, it says, so Joshua, son of Nun, called the priest and he's relaying the message to them. Take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, have the seven priests carry the trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army to advance, march around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the Ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the Ark. All this time, the trumpets were sounding, but Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voice. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then at that time, shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the army returned to camp and spent the night there. So we see the strategy starting to get lived out. Then in verse 12, Joshua got up early the next morning and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the Ark of the Lord and blowing their trumpets just like they did the day before. The armed men went ahead of them and the rear guard followed the Ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. And now we finally arrive to the seventh day in verse 15. Verse 15. 
On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and they marched around the city seven times in the same manner. Except on that day, they circled the, seven, uh, circled the city not once, but seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army to finally shout, for the Lord has already given you the city. The city and all that is in it are devoted to the Lord. So he's giving some very important instructions, instructions that we need to remember for next week's message as well. He says in verse 17, the city and all that is in it is devoted, it's consecrated. It belongs to the Lord, not to you. Um, So only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house will be spared because she hid the spies. But reminder, he's emphasizing again, keep away from the devoted things, the things that belong to God. And he, you know, spells it out even more. And he's like, you know, remember uh, that if you do this, you'll bring destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble in it. Guys, all the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. Do you see the emphasis that he's placing on this? He's like, remember, this isn't yours. It's God's. Okay, that's going to be coming up next week. So tuck that back for next week if you decide to come back. I hope you do. Uh, Verse 20, when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, a miracle happens. The walls collapse. So everyone charged straight in and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it. Men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. And this is the part you may have forgotten from your Sunday school class. Some of us, when we read this, it's almost like our stomach starts to turn a little bit. And you're like, I don't remember that being in there. And so I think a natural question that a lot of us, if not all of us, are asking is, what do we do with a passage like this? Why would God command the killing of people? Anyone have any answers, right? Like, just let that sit a little bit. You're just like, what do we do with this? And I think the tension that you're feeling is actually a good thing. It's one of the things that comes up whenever you read the Bible. You're bound to get to a a place in Scripture that makes you scratch your head that makes you ask questions about the Bible or God or even Christianity in itself. And I want to provide you with maybe three things to consider. Uh, Maybe this may answer your questions. Maybe they won't, but I think they're important to remember. The first thing is when you get to a passage like this that we have to remember is we have to remember who God is for. And by remembering that, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of the angel of the Lord. You know, sometimes when we're reading this passage, we're tempted to think that it's just Israel versus Canaan. But that's simply not true. It is God's will against human's will. It is God's battle that he is currently fighting. And it's not against a specific nation versus a specific nation, though God is using a nation to accomplish his means. It's not ethnic-based. It's not nationality-based. It is based off of God's will. And so we must remember that the angel of Yahweh says it's not against the good guys or the bad guys. It's about, are you on God's side? Because what we see is even in the story of Rahab, someone who was maybe in the line of fire was able to be grafted in. And she would play a very important role as you read through the rest of the Old Testament, bearing uh, uh, kids to the line of David a very important figure in the Old Testament. And so it's not good guys versus bad guys, but it is remembering who God is for. The second thing that I would say though is remember that God is still patient and loving, but yet also incredibly just. Now this is a tension that a lot of us can struggle with sometimes, but it is a reality of God that he is both fully loving, fully patient, and yet at the same time fully just. There's a couple of passages leading up to this that can help us remember this patience and justice. 
In Genesis chapter 15, we go back to the very promise that God gave to Abraham, that Abraham would have many descendants and they would inherit this nation. It says in verse 13 that the Lord said to him, know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there, speaking about their time in Egypt. But God says, I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. And afterward, they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. But pay attention to this little nugget in verse 16. God says, in the fourth generation, you know, after about 400 years or so, in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back to this very land that Abraham is in, the promised land. For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. As you read through the, uh, specifically the first five books of the, the Old Testament, you'll maybe see this phrase pop up a couple of times where it talks about the sin of the Amorites. Unfortunately, we don't know everything uh, that is going on with the Amorites at this time or the Canaanites specifically, but we do get a couple of glimpses and I'll highlight two passages. First in Leviticus, then in Deuteronomy. In Leviticus 18, God again is speaking to Moses and he says, speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt where you used to live, but you must also not do as they do in the land of Canaan where I am bringing you. Do not follow their practices. It goes on in verse 24 of the same chapter. God says, do not defile yourselves in any of these ways because this is how the nations that I'm going to drive out uh, before you became defiled. So all of Leviticus 18 is some of the practices that were either going on in the Canaan land or going on in the Egypt land. But we get a little bit more of a glimpse into it in Deuteronomy chapter 12. God again um, is speaking to Moses and it says, the Lord your God will cut off before you the nations you are about to invade and dispossess. When you have driven out these nations and you settled into their land, after they have been destroyed before you, be careful not to be ensnared by inquiring about their gods, saying, how do these nations serve their gods? We will do the same. You must not, Israel, worship the Lord your God in their way because in worshiping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things that the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as a sacrifices to their God. Whatever was going on in the land of Canaan, it is very clear that it is sin before God. And we see sin all around us even today. And the question we keep asking God is, God, what are you going to do about this? The question today is no different from probably the same one asked back then. God, the sin of the Amorites, what are you going to do about this? And that is when we get to exactly Joshua chapter 6 and the conquering of the land. We see that this conquest is God being full of mercy and patience and love, but yet at the same time having a high standard for justice and bringing about his justice on the earth. You know, it, it makes me think because some of us may be thinking, well, he didn't seem very patient to just conquer him like that. But then I think like, why did he have them march around the city once for six days straight? Maybe God in his heart of hearts was hoping that the people of Jericho would relent, that they would take down the barriers and give themselves to the Israelites. But instead they stayed securely barred and they settled themselves in. We see that God is both fully patient, but yet also fully just. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slow, slowness. Instead, God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but desiring everyone to come to repentance. That is God's heart. He doesn't desire to see anyone perish, but yet his will must be done and his justice must prevail. So we must remember who God is for. We must remember that God is patient and just. And then the third thing I would just say is, remember Jesus. The story doesn't like stop at Joshua 6. It continues on when we get to Jesus. 
And an important question I would ask you, if your question right now as you read this is like, if your statement is like, this isn't fair, I know I've heard that before, and even I've felt that too. As I read Joshua chapter 6, verses 20 through 21, the question that almost comes up is like, God, this doesn't seem fair. Why are you doing this? Why are you allowing this to happen? If, If you resonate with that question of like, God, this doesn't seem fair, the question I would ask you is what seems fair about the cross? Sometimes we've grown up in church and Christianity and we understand the cross to be God's demonstration of love and mercy on our lives. But let me tell you, there's nothing fair about that. God poured out his wrath and his his justice on the son of the living God. But he did it for you and I, friends. There's nothing fair about that, but it is good news. And so we must remember as we struggle with passages like Joshua 6, that it doesn't stop in, and in there. It ends at the cross and that, that leaves good news for all of us here today. That we can be grafted into the family of God and experience his love, his mercy, and his grace. So I don't know if that answers the questions that you have and if you still have that feeling wrapped up into your stomach, but hopefully this helps. But my encouragement to you would be to continue to read scripture. Write those questions down, discuss it with your small group or the people in your life. And maybe if you have questions about scripture, find a small group leader or a Bible teacher or um, even one of us pastors, we would be happy to just sit with you in that tension. But we still have to continue on because the story is not yet finished. If we pick up back in verse 22, we read that Joshua said to two of the men who had spied out the land, he said to them, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with the oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, uh, her father and mother, her brothers and sisters and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it. But they did obey. They put the silver, gold, the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho and she lives among the Israelites to this day. Even at the writing of this very book, Rahab and her family still was with Israel. So if they had any questions, what a cool way to be able to go to Rahab and her family and just say, hey, can you tell me your story? And then we close out this and we get just a little bit of a, (laughs) kind of a strange ending to the story. But it says, at that time, Joshua pronounced a a solemn oath or a curse. said, curse before the Lord is the one who undertakes to rebuild the city, Jericho. Um, If anyone decides to rebuild the city, uh, he says at the cost, it will be at the cost of their firstborn son when they lay the foundations and it'll be uh, the cost of the youngest when he sets up the gates. And if you're an extreme Bible nerd and you wanna see this actually come to fruition, it's right before the story of Elijah in the book of 1 Kings. In 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 34, there's a man named, I believe it's uh, Hillel or Hiel of Bethel. And he actually rebuilds Jericho at the cost of his firstborn and lastborn son. But only if you're a Bible nerd and you want to catch that out later this week. And so finally, we close this, uh, this chapter. And it says, so the Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread all throughout the land. So I think as we close this uh, chapter, I think the question some of us may be asking is what do we do with the story, right? Like it's helpful to be able to, to understand it That's been my hope, at least, as we've been walking through this, that like you just have a better understanding of what Joshua 6 is all about. But some of us struggle with like, how do we apply this to our lives today? You know, like that's great for the the Israelites back then, you know, 3,000, 4,000 odd years ago. What about me today? How does this story apply to my life today? 
And there can be a variety of conclusion or application points that maybe you're taking away. And my encouragement to you would be like, whatever the Lord is speaking to you, take that away. One of the promises that we have in scripture is that his word will never return void. And so I believe and trust that God has and is speaking to you in this moment. But as as I was wrestling with this passage, this one phrase kind of came to mind as an application point, that success is marked by trust and obedience. That's what true success looks like. It's not in our accolades or our accomplishments, though that is oftentimes what the world would like to look at success as. But for the, the Christ follower, for the Christian, our ultimate success in life is marked by trust and obedience. And Jesus describes that kind of life as one that is extremely blessed when we trust and obey all that the Lord has commanded. But the haunting question that is left before us is this, whose side are you on? As we hearken back to the angel of the Lord in Joshua chapter five, that is the question that the angel of the Lord asked Joshua. And it's the one that I would ask each and every one of us today. Um, Which side are you on? Are you trusting and obeying what the Lord has commanded you to do? Or do you find yourself on another side? It'd be my encouragement and my hope for you today that you would find yourself and continue to live out life on the Lord's side. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the time that we have to open it and read it. God, I pray that we would continue to become people of your word, that it wouldn't just sit on our bookshelves or on our nightstands at home, but it would truly be something that we meditate on day and night, that we are in your word, whether it's a chapter, a verse, or an entire book of the Bible that we read through, God, would you continue to make us, inform us into people of your word. God, we know that you are good and we trust in you. So would you continue to give us strength and courage and trust as we continue to obey you in our lives today? We pray this all in Jesus' name.